in my personal view, uh, it sounds so inconsistent if this would be angels. Because the trait, angels are asexual. Okay? Even Jesus Christ said, when we go to heaven, we don't give to marriage anymore. We will be like angels. So even the fact that the angels are attracted to men, that's not consistent of what a spirit trait is. Okay? Uh, that's the, the, the trait of the human beings. Now, this is my, this is my view. And some of the uh, great preachers, okay, and some Bible teachers would have this view, that the sons of man would actually pertain to the children of God. Perhaps the sons of Seth. If we go back to uh, backtrack a bit, Genesis chapter 4, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also was a son born, and he named him Enosh. And then what happened? Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Okay? The spirituality in man began to be awakened. And personally, I believe these are the sons of, of God. Christians, believers of God. And if you think about it, the sons of God who believe in God, who look to God, they are still human beings, right? They are still sinners. They can still look around and fall into sin. And that is a very consistent scenario which describes a child of God who is not very careful. Okay? Correct? Amen. Sometimes Christians forget their title, sons of God. Okay, we tend to look around, we see the beauty of the world, we get attracted to the world, the people of the world, the customs, the practices, the games of the world, the radical values of the world, and then we sin and we fall. Okay? As a matter of fact, the, the Son of God, the child of God, does that mean you are not susceptible to sin? You will still sin, correct? And to add to that, you are the favorite target of the devil. He wants you to fall into sin. And one of the tools of the devil is this. Beautiful women. Okay? Especially, I'm talking specifically for, for the guys here. The daughters of man. Okay? And, and when, when you talk about, when you look about, uh, uh, think about this, the sons of God who are calling to God, and then the daughters of men, okay, the daughters of men who perhaps have the trait of men denotes women who are not God followers. And how do we describe man at this generation, at this point in time, as uh, Genesis chapter 6 says? It says here, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. This is what God saw in man at this point in time. The word great comes from the Hebrew word rab which means abundant in quantity, size, age, rank, and quality. That's great, describing the wickedness. A wickedness that it's, uh, uh, in quantity, it means it never runs out. In size, perhaps the effect is not only for an individual, the effect is many. The age, perhaps, you know, when you, you, when you did not put great as a description for age, uh, it describes someone who you look up to, okay? That's great. So perhaps the sin there is something that people would, uh, you know, back out and they would just let it go, you know. Rank, you see today, they want to produce something that's greater than what was done a few seconds ago. Quality, perhaps we're talking about the sophisticated, you know, the level of sophistication of sin at that point to make even the scams today look like child's play, if you know what I'm saying. And this is what God saw in man at that point. The sin of man was great, and that the every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The mind no more has desired to think godly and noble things. Does it, decide, uh, it, it, even, it doesn't even desire to develop that which is good. In other words, continuously. Okay? People then perhaps are even able to distinguish right and wrong, but their enjoyment is doing that which is wrong. You, you know what I'm saying? This is the, the quality of uh, man that day. Um, if you're a teacher, if you're a teacher, you have a naughty student. Have you ever had a naughty student? 
even in spite of all the things that you do, the student still becomes foolish, okay? decides to be foolish, doesn't want to leave you year after year. He wants to come back. Multiply that millions of times. That's the evilness that, uh, uh, that was ex happening here. And what made it worse? Okay, what made it worse? This one. The sons of God took wives for themselves. The sons of God intermarried with the daughters of men. You know, the sons of God are supposed to be agent of grace by God. Somehow become affected. You know what I'm saying? They became deactivated. In, in, uh, uh, in the recent news, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they set this satellite in the United States, in, 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 uh, in Mars, call it Opportunity. Uh, for 15 years, it was faithfully sending pictures from Mars to uh, the Earth. And then on February 23, it encountered some kind of uh, storm in Mars. And uh, it has no choice, but you know, the battery was, uh, was not regenerated anymore with the solar panel. The solar panels was, was uh, covered. And somebody said, the last message was, uh, my battery is low. Everything is getting dark. You know, that, I think that was the message. Somebody said that. I could just imagine the people who made that satellite might have felt sadness. In me, I, I'm just reading that, I really felt sad for that. It got deactivated. Think about God, looking at the sons of men, and he said, wow, look at this, my sons. The purpose that I had with them is for them to proliferate grace on the earth. But then, this is what they did. They took themselves for, uh, took wives, and somehow they are now deactivated. They are now non-functional now. Okay. You know, God desires that His grace Lord, proliferate the earth more than His wrath. Amen. He wants His grace to pro proliferate. Blah blah blah. blah. <laughs> proliferate. Okay, got it. You know, he doesn't like that good was infected by evil. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ was even talking about this in the parable of uh, the sower. Okay? The third soil, which is the thorny soil, the thorns are the cares of this world, the values of this world, the deceitfulness of this world. So that when the Word of God, the seed came there, what happened to the Word of God? It got choked with the thorns. Now let me tell you something. It is not the soil which is the victim here. As a matter of fact, the soil is the accomplice. It's an accomplice. The victim here is the Word of God. Okay? The victim in that parable is the Word of God. Why? Because the soil wants to accept everything. He wants to put everything on one spot. He accepts the Word of God. He accepts the Word of man, the values of God, the values of man, the treasures of God, and the treasures of man, you know. The music of God and the music of the world. Everything. He wants them in all one spot. You cannot have that if you plan to grow in the Lord. So what happens? The word of God got choked. That's it. The, Jesus Christ was talking about that even in the New Testament. Living the Christian life involves the conscious desire to choose that which is good. Not to win God's favor. But because you already have it. Amen? Got that? Living the Christian life involves a conscious desire to choose that which is good, not to win God, not to win God's favor, but because you already have it. Okay? You know, uh, God's word also teaches us to overcome evil with good. Okay? Now look at this. Let's uh, continue further. Genesis chapter 6 verse 6. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and was grieved in his heart. Now perhaps this is one of the hardest verse to understand in the Bible. Because it seems to talk about a God who regrets. It seems to talk about a God who makes a mistake. Now I cannot imagine God pulling his hair and saying, no, 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 this is wrong. I mean, I can't imagine God doing that. Or God talking to the mirror and said, see, I told you. 
We, 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 we can imagine God doing that. Okay? We have to go back to the root source of this verse. And that is God saw the wickedness of man. And what was the result? His heart was grieved. Okay? Now, um, the original language of the Bible, specifically the Old Testament, was in Hebrew. And uh, there really are terms and ideas uh, that's very hard to look for a counterpart in the English. As a matter of fact, we, in a way, in our Tagalog language, we can experience that too. Like, how? what is the English counterpart of the word sayang? How do you translate that? Sayang. Wasted. Wasted. I mean, we can, we can just say wasted. I mean, but then wasted, it's all another set of ideas by itself. It doesn't swap in, if you know what I'm saying. Okay? Um, the word sayang, it's more of an expression. For me, I think the English counterpart would be something like... Ah. I mean, that, that's the English counterpart of sayang. I mean, that's my translation for that, you know. And there are other things, okay, there are other things, okay. Uh, um, there are words in Korea, uh, concepts in the Korean language that doesn't translate well in the English Bible. To the point that the theologians need to explain it because it is bordering to something like a mystical explanation. I think of the word chi or power. That, that's it. We kind of discussed that in seminary. Same thing here. So the closest word that they can get to for this verse is sorry or repentant. But I believe the idea is God is about to do something that He doesn't want to do, but He has to. You know? He doesn't want to do this. He's not happy doing this, but He has to. And to us, in our in our own understanding, when we say we regret doing something, we are sorry in doing something, at the back of my mind, there's an intention of not repeating it again. You know what I'm saying? Because we regret it, we don't plan to do it again. I am sorry for what I did. Now, it seems like that's not what the Bible, the, this verse means, because if God was sorry, for creating human beings, and that he's regretting it, my question is, then why did he preserve Noah and the other animals? If he, if he really is sorry for creating man, he could just told Noah, hey, you know guys, I made a mistake, I'll just bring you to heaven, we'll just take, you know, we'll just restart. But that's not what happened here, correct? What happened here, he preserved the good people and a number of animals in the ark, so they can restart again. No, God loves humanity so much. And I believe in his heart, he doesn't want to eradicate something like the 97-98% of the people. But he loves, he loves man. Okay? He gives his grace, and he can also withdraw it. Point number two. God's grace is only for him to give and to withdraw. Okay? You know, the grace of God is meant to change us for the better. When He gives it to us, He expects that we change. Okay, remember the parable of the wicked servant in the New Testament? Jesus Christ was telling about this wicked servant who was a very big debt. His master was practically choking him to pay. And then he pleaded, said, Lord, I cannot pay, please forgive me. And then the king said, okay, I will have mercy to you. Go. And then when he went out, he was rejoicing, but then he saw his servant. The servant also has another servant. What did he do? He choked his servant. And he said to that servant, Hey, you owe me, now you have to pay me. Now, this is a wicked servant. It looks like he's also not a wise servant. He thought maybe the show of power would gain the respect of people watching them. But the, the reverse was the different. The other servant who saw them went back to the king and told you know, the servant you forgave, he's very cruel now to his own servant. So this wicked servant, unwise servant, got recalled. He was reprimanded by the king, he was cursed. And then the forgiveness was revoked. Okay. God's grace is intended to make us holy and change us. 
But this was not happening in Genesis chapter 6. I believe God was giving them everything. But there's a point in time when the Lord would say, this is enough. There's no more change. May we not come to that point where in we are already immersed in God's grace. And yet we are not going back to Him in grace. Now some commentators would even say that God was also thinking of the next generation. He wants the next generation to experience a clean slate because this generation, Genesis chapter 6, these people are very dangerous. They don't have respect for morality, spirituality. And perhaps the feeling is when you are in the middle of this pack of people, perhaps uh, it's like walking on a dark aisle, a dark alley, and you're afraid of yourself. Perhaps that's the, the, the feeling here. I remember the first time I came in the United States, uh, I was checked in in Holiday Inn. Two blocks away is our project, Roman Haas. Uh, our instruction is by 5 p.m. you need to log out and you should not be in the streets by 6 p.m. Uh, that's the instruction to us. And uh, I think that, there was a time I forgot. I got uh, carried away doing my shopping in this, some kind of a 7-Eleven store. I forgot it was about to be, uh, to be 6 p.m. and I see the owner following me. <laughs> Tap me, uh, are you done? Oh yes, and they said, okay, I'm sorry. Then I paid, after I paid, he closed his gate, steel gate, I was the last customer. And then oh, I began to be afraid because now I am alone in the street. I practically ran to my hotel because I, I, I could see the graffiti on the floors you know, I don't want to be caught up in any gang-related activity in some area in Philadelphia. Now that's happening today, that happened today. So you could just imagine back then. So perhaps the Lord loves His future children. I need to prepare a good place for them. Perhaps the message to us is this. You know, we, we kind of... Uh, we might have overstretched things like God is gracious, God is gracious, He understands, He forgives. But you know what? He also punishes. He's a just God. Isaiah 55, 6, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Amen? Amen. He is gracious. Let's take advantage of that. Amen? We have to be an agent of grace in this world. Now, before I leave the second point, uh, you might say, so did God change His mind? Well, God never changes. Okay. He's still the same loving, caring, gracious God. He may have just changed His dealings with man. Why? Because man changes. Okay. But the same loving God never changes. Okay. I'm going to move forward now. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Perhaps also one of my proof that God is not disillusioned with man. That He is not about the trigger-happy God who wants to eradicate, eradicate man. But you know, He's still looking for that certain inch of goodness in man and then He found Noah. And uh, there's something about Noah that God also saw. This guy has a, he, he worships me. Okay? And I believe uh, uh, it's the same thing that Noah's father saw in him. Let's do a backdrop. Genesis chapter 5, 28-29. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son and he called his name Noah saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands. Because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. See, his father saw something in Noah. This, this guy, he will comfort us. Okay. Kind of sounded like at this point in time, now moving forward, Noah at this point in time in Genesis chapter 6, he is the only one who's living the righteous life. Okay? He's the only one living the righteous life. Principle number three. It is not impossible to live a holy life, even if you're surrounded by evil. Amen? 
It's not impossible to live a holy life even if you're surrounded by evil. Many times we would, we would make an excuse, ah, because I got pulled by my gang or my peers, you know. Now somebody says, birds of the same feather flock together, okay. Another one says, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are, okay. But you know, there really are times wherein you have no choice but to be surrounded by people who doesn't share your love for the Lord, who doesn't understand your faith, who may not value the same values that you practice in life. You have no choice but to live within them. But what do you do? You just have to be determined that I will, I'm going to stay under God's will. Okay? Live a holy life, not a judgmental life. By the way, not a whole, I'm holier than you, hey, don't touch me, I'm a Christian, not that kind of life. But a Christian that says, hey, the Lord loves you. Okay? And we know the secret to that is to always be close to God all the time. As a matter of fact, it is impossible to live a holy life without God, especially when you are in the middle of an evil world. Amen? Holiness is not environmental. Okay? Holiness, it's spiritual, it's internal. As a matter of fact, if you are only holy because everything is around you are good, then perhaps that's a fake holiness. Perhaps that's a, what? a vacation or whatever. Okay. Now we said a while ago that God can give His grace and God can withdraw His grace. Now it seems that, you know, uh, in the next few verses, we would see the display wherein God withdrew His grace from man, but not from Noah. Remember, God started, uh, the men started to call upon God. And by the time that Noah was an adult, it looks like he was the only one calling God. Everybody else stopped calling God. You know what I'm saying? And I believe God's grace for him was extended because no one, in spite of his uh, neighbors not calling upon God anymore, he continued to call God. And, and this is only one guy. And I believe, you know, the reason why we are here is because of the faithfulness of one man. I believe all of us, we believe, we teach that all of us came from Adam and Eve. But let me also tell you that we also came from Noah. Amen? Uh, last principle. It does not take a lot of people to open heaven's gate for His grace to flow. Another way of saying this, it only takes one man or one woman to decide that I'm going to stand for the Lord. And then that would be enough for God to bring a difference. Amen? If you decide that I'm going to start standing for the Lord, you know, people, uh, the Lord can use that to bring a great miracle in, 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 this, uh, in this world. I'd like to request everyone to bow down their heads and close their eyes. I want you to meditate upon the message today. Think about today's message and Search your heart. Maybe the Lord told you something. Maybe the Lord told you that He has saved you and now He wants you not only to die for Him, but most of all to live for Him. A challenge that perhaps is even more, uh, it's even harder to do. So if you think you have not been a faithful witness for, for God, Decide that you will be today. Secondly, if you have not known the Lord Jesus Christ yet, meaning you want to go to heaven but you're not sure, you you feel like you need to do a lot of things. You feel like you need to be good. Let me tell you, nobody can work for heaven. So nobody can work for heaven. It's too high a price. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can do that for us. All we need to do is to ask Him to save us. 
So in your seat right now, if you want to go to heaven, I tell you, I like to tell you, don't try too hard. Just surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell Him you're a sinner. Ask Him to forgive you of your sin and to save you. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds, minutes.